Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Nahmaduhu wa nasalli ala rasul nabiyyul karim A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Ar-Rahmanirrahim Maliki yawmiddin Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in Ihdana al-sirat al-mustaqim Sirat al-ladhina an'amta alayhim ghayr al-mawh ذوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم بارك على سيدنا ولان محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبصار وديائها وعلى آله وصحبه دائما أبدا صلاة وسلاما عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إن شاء الله we'll start talking about Hajj since time for Hajj is coming up as we've said you know brother Abu Bakr his intention of going this year along with his wife. Uh, unfortunately, you know, last year, he had intention last year, but, you know, with that, with the COVID, and even this year, they're limiting how many people can go. So, you know, inshallah, he'll uh, be one of those who, who will be able to go, inshallah. But, um, you know, Hajj covers a lot. going to go over the Hajj of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and along with that you know kind of bringing bring in other aspects of the Hajj into it uh, and then in the end inshallah uh, talk about uh, Abu Bakr Shibli Rahmatullahi's conversation with one of his students after that student had come back from the Hajj uh, you know when we talk about the Hajj of Rasulullah Sallallahu we're looking at what he did uh, that conversation actually explains to us the reality of what he did. You know, we look at what he did superficially, but the reality of what he's doing is something, you know, for most of us that's hidden. Uh, so we can look at it from, from that perspective as well, inshallah. Last week we spoke about Hudaybiyah. Uh, and in the context of, of the Abrahamic Accords, where you have, you know, these government muftis and sheikhs who are trying to push the accords as something similar to what Rasulullah did in Hudaybiyah. And as we talked about, they're not the same. And there's massive difference. Uh, you know, one of the points that uh, this so-called scholar was trying to bring up was that, see, even when Rasulullah when he signed that treaty, the companions w were upset. But if you analyze what happened, you know, one is they had come with the intention of making the Umrah. And now they're having to go back without making Umrah. Uh, and then when Rasulullah Sassam, he comes out, you know, of course, after that everything is done, he comes out and he orders them, because the normal part of the Umrah, the end of the Umrah is you shave your head or you cut your, cut your hair. So he asked them to cut to shave their heads, and no one, no one responds. And so he goes in his tent, and his wife Bibi Umm Salma, radiallahu anha, who is with him, you know, and he mentions this to her. She he says, "Ya Rasulullah, so, so why don't you shave your head first? And then they will comply. Because she understood them. And as soon as Rasulullah comes out with his head shaved, all of them start shaving their heads. The thing though is, that here's, here's the catch. In the process of shaving their heads, you know, they were also cutting, you know, they were doing this in such a way that they ended up cutting each other. So are there, there are people who take this action of theirs and they say, oh, see they were so upset and so mad that they were cutting each other while they were shaving their heads. 
And the, you know, when, when you analyze what somebody's doing, you have to analyze their character and their nature. You have to know their character or nature first. You know, it's like if you see two martial artists fighting. Well, they may be fighting, but then they may be sparring. And there's a huge difference. You know, you look at it from a distance, and you say, oh, you know, they're trying to kill each other. And the reality is they're just practicing. You know, they're really good friends. So when we look at the nature of the companions of Rasulullah they aren't cutting their heads because, you know, they're angry. They're doing this because they realize that they've delayed on the order of Rasulullah and there's such a rush to shave their heads that in the process, some of them are getting a lot of nicks and cuts. Umar, Radio, of course, he goes to Rasulullah and he says, Ya Rasulullah didn't you say that we would make the Umar? And then Rasulullah said, yes, I did, but I didn't say we'd do it this year. You know, he saw that dream, and the companions are the ones who said, oh, let's go now. So to say that they were upset, yes, you know, if you look at some of the clauses of, of the treaty, it seemed as if they were against the Muslim. But those are the clauses that Quraysh came back the next year and said, oh, we want you to change these clauses. You know, that if somebody from our side comes over to your side, you know, you have to hand them back. They said, oh, we don't want this anymore because of other issues. I'm not going into details of that, but other issues that came up. But part of the treaty was also that they would not enter Mecca this year, but they would come back next year. And this is important to note, related to the Hajj and the way we do the Hajj. You know, even though, you know, yes, the Hajj is the Sunnah of Ibrahim alayhi salam, but the way we do things is the Sunnah of Rasulullah And the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallam supersedes all Sunnahs, always. And so, when they left the next year, when the Muslims left Mecca, I mean Medina Munawwara for Mecca, uh, to go and make the Umrah, as was agreed in the treaty. So now, on the way, you know, Quraysh has spread this rumor that, oh, you know, these people, are they're famished. You know, they haven't had anything good to eat. They're weak. And all of these rumors. So Rasulullah some he orders his companions that when you put on the ahram while you are making tawaf you know the normal way the sunnah of Ibrahim al-Islam was that both, shoulder, both shoulders were covered so he would make tawaf with, with the ahram on and both shoulders would be covered and he would simply walk around the Kaaba Rasulullah some he tells them that whoever shows them his strength I guarantee for him paradise And so he said, open your right arm. Keep your right arm open while you're making tawaf. So now when we make tawaf, the ahram comes underneath and comes over the left shoulder. So that the right arm is showing. You know, to show them your strength. And when you go around the Kaaba, the first four times, you know, it's seven times around the Kaaba. The first four times, you go very fast. Walk very firmly and very fast. And then the last three, you walk normally. Again, to show them your strength, you know, that we're not famished and weak. And when Quraysh, who had gone on the mountaintops and they're looking back down on this and they see this, they say, oh, you know, these people, they're not weak. They're so strong. They're running like deer. This is also why the scholars have allowed you know, certain processions to come out. as a sign of strength. You know, so you show the disbelievers that we're not weak. The same thing when these protests in favor of Palestine, you know, we don't, you shouldn't go to these protests with the intention that you're going to change the, you know, change what the governments do. But we should go to them to show solidarity to our brothers and sisters who are being oppressed.
and also as a sign of strength that we're not just going to lay down and let you walk all over us. <coughs> of course, the following year is when Quraysh, they violate Sulah Hadabiyah by attacking Muslims in Makkah, in the Haram. So now Rasulullah <coughs> brings a force of 10,000 and walks into the city without bloodshed. You know, there are certain exceptions to that because there are certain people who Rasulullah mentioned by name and said that even if they are holding on to the Kaaba, to the, to the Kiswa or, or the, uh, the cloth covering the Kaaba, even if they are holding on to that, they are to be executed for the crimes that they have committed. And if you look at their names, most of them are people who knew who Rasulullah was, who had accepted him at one point and then denied him and cursed him. But going forward from here now, 10th year of Hijri. Because the year before, Rasulullah did not go for Hajj. When Mecca was conquered, this is when the Hajj becomes an obligation. Because before that, you couldn't go. Ninth year of Hijri, Rasulullah he sends Abu Bakr radiallahu as the Amir or the, at the head of the Hajj. The following year, two months before uh, Zil Hajj, he makes the announcement that he intends on going for Hajj. Uh, news spreads very rapidly. Everybody is anxious that they should make Hajj with Rasulullah. Rasulullah. Two months before the announcement, he had sent Ali down to Yemen as the Emir of an army that he sent down to Yemen. And this is this will be important to note or remember as we're talking about this later on. So of course all of Arabia now knows that Rasulullah intends on Hajj. Everybody's getting ready. Many clans they come to Medina Munawwara that they should leave with the Rasulullah. Others meet him along the way, and then others will meet him in Makkah. On the 25th of Dhul Qada, you know, this is Shawwal, next month is Dhul Qada, and then after that is Dhul Hajj. So on the 25th of Dhul Qada, according to most scholars, and Saturday, the Rasulullah Sussum, he sets out from Medina Munawwara. They come to a place called Dhul Hulayfa. Dhul Hulayfa is roughly about a little over four miles outside away outside of Medina away from the masjid of Rasulullah so it's maybe you know a little over three and a half miles outside the outskirts of Medina Manawara. so he stops there spends a night there yeah. all of his wives are with him on this journey you know he spends time with all of them and then the next day around the time of Dhuhr, you know, he makes the ghusl of ihram. You know, so for when you don the ihram, ihram for the man, of course, is two sheets, unsewn sheets. One is the loincloth that you put on underneath, and the other is the one that covers the top, the sheet that you, as I said, you know, when, when no, normally if you're not making tawaf, you have both shoulders covered. So he makes ghusl, puts on the ihram, makes two rakat salat of the intention of ihram, and recites the uh, talbi or the labbaik, labbaik allahumma, labbaik. Here I am, oh my Lord, here I am. He makes the intention of qiran hajj, the three forms of hajj. So, and he gives the companions the options to choose whichever one they wish. Qiran is where when you're going for Hajj, you enter Mecca, you make Umrah, but you keep the Ihram on. So you, 
you stay in the, in the condition of ihram. So no cutting the hair, no cutting the nails, all of the things that are prohibited in ihram stay. So because you're still in ihram, you're not leaving the ihram. So you go, you make umrah, you wait till the hajj begins, and then, then you start the process. And then, so you don't come out of ihram until after hajj is complete. The other form is tamatto, which is where, you know, you, you put on the ihram, you make umrah, you come out of the ihram, you wait for the hajj, when time for hajj comes, you put the ihram back on. And then, so now you're out of the ihram for that time, for a period. And then the third form is ifrad, where you put on the ihram, you go straight for hajj, there is no umrah, you go straight for the hajj, you make the hajj, and then complete the uh, rites of the Hajj, and then you come out of Ihram. Uh, as far as people that go these days, you know, if you're going to Mecca first, it's, pro it's you know, usually easier and better for most people to do the Tamatto, which is where you do the Ihram, make Umrah, come out of Ihram, and then when Hajj starts, you go back into Ihram. You know, if you're going to Medina Munawwara first, then you know, a lot of times those groups will come straight for the Hajj. So then you put, make the intention of Ifrad. So when they leave, you know, Dhul Halifa, you know, the Sunnah is that as you're going up or you're coming to any high place, you make the Talbih loud. Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik. Loud. When you're going down, you make it silently. And so, you know, so every loud place he's making it. When he climbs his ca onto his camel, he makes it loud. You know, people see him. Uh, and this continues on. They eventually come to a place called a valley, which is Ruha. And Ruha actually uh, is also where he, he stayed. Ruha is between Medina and Badr. So he stayed in this valley on the way to the Battle of Badr. When he arrives here now, he allows the companions, he gives them the knowledge that this is where 70, 70 Anbiya, 70 Prophets of Allah have made Salat. Hajj is not something unique to Islam. Or rather I should say, Hajj is not something unique to this Ummah. The way we do it again is different in certain aspects. But, you know, when Ibrahim, when Allah SWT ordered Ibrahim Islam to rebuild the Kaaba, and I emphasize this point, rebuild. You know, if you look at the history of the Kaaba and the history of Masjid Al-Aqsa, you know, these two masajid are the first places of worship built on the earth. And there's only 40 years difference between the two constructions, initial constructions, or at least the foundations being laid. You know, most scholars are of the opinion that the angels laid the foundations and then Adam salam, you know, he initially raised the foundations for the Kaaba and then 40 years later raised the foundations for Masjid Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. The, the Kaaba is directly under Baytul Ma'mur. Baytul Ma'mur is a house on the seventh heaven that is built you know, and this is what the angels make tawaf around. And even in Surah Ibrahim, if you read Surah Ibrahim, verse, I think, either 36 or 37, where when Ibrahim al-Islam, when he is commanded to leave, you know, his family, his wife, Bibi Hajar, and his son, Ismail al-Islam, there, you know, he makes a dua to Allah. And in part of that dua, he says, Oh Allah, I am leaving my family next to your sacred house. So this dua has been made even before Ibrahim al-Islam is commanded to rebuild the Kaaba. So again, you know, which reaffirms that this, you know, the foundation was already there. But when Ibrahim al-Islam and Ismail al-Islam build it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders them, make the call. Call the people. And Ibrahim al-Islam says, Ya Allah, I mean, there's no one here to hear. There's no one here to hear the call. Who's going to hear me 
in the middle of an empty desert. So Los Matos says, you make the call, and I will deliver the message. So he makes the call. And every soul, every person that existed then and every soul that was to come later heard the call. And everyone who responded to the call with Labaik, he goes for Hajj. And if he responded once, he makes one Hajj. If he responded twice, he makes two Hajj, and so forth. When this happened, though, it's important to note that here, too. When this happened, Shaitan, you know, he's always asking for his portion of things. So he also, he asks, Allah, where's my share in this? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, you also make a call. So he makes a call. And everybody who responded to his call also goes for Hajj. But they come there with a different intention. And this is why, you know, people, they say, oh, you know, I went for Hajj and there were so many people, they were, they were picking, cutting people's pockets and they're doing this and doing that. Well, you know, they didn't respond to the call of Ibrahim al -Islam. They responded to a different call. And this is also where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, he said that a time will come when the leaders will come to Hajj for show. You know, if you look at the leaders, what it all? You know, they got to show themselves, oh, I made Hajj. And then, you know, the, 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 uh, the king, he opens the door for them so they can go inside the Kaaba. And everybody else gets pushed aside. And he said, and the rich will come for vacation. You know, when, when I went in 2003, uh, there was a special package, premium package. And at that time, my package was $3,000. I think the average package these days is $10,000 from the U.S. But at my time, it was $3,000. So that was for the commoners. We had a premium package that was $7,000. You know, I accidentally ended up at their tent because I walked from, from Mecca to Mena. You know, the other group, they went, and I knew I would get there before them because if you're going by car, uh, you're, you know, you're basically crawling. So I got there before them, and I wasn't sure where to go, so I asked somebody, they direct me to this other place, and I end up at the wrong tent. This is the premium package tent. So you got, have guys in, in bow ties serving. You know, everybody has their air-conditioned little section. And these people, when the time for throwing the stones at Shaitan, they didn't even go. They had people assigned that they would simply go to give the stones to and you go on my behalf. I'm going to lay back and relax. You know, have my cool drink and just, this is my hajj. So he said, Rasulullah he said, rich will come for vacation. The middle class will come for business. You know, in 91 when I went, in Mina, none of the vendors were allowed into Mina. 2003 when I went, Mina was basically an open flea market. And the poor will come to beg. So they have actually, you know, while I was there, one of the brothers told me, he said, he said, be very careful. And I noted it myself, and I'll tell you how I noted it. Be very careful because, you know, these guys, they hire people, or they bring people in from outside to come and beg, and they get a share of it. So I was standing at a shop, and this woman, she comes from this side, and she, you know, is begging for some money. So I give her a few reals. Then I notice that she walks over to this other man, and she hands him something. And then she comes back, because she thought I didn't notice who she was, she comes back and now she's coming from this side. Again, begging for some money. The shop owner, who was a kid, or the guy who, the kid that was running the shop, she, he runs her off. And again, exactly as the Rasulullah has said. 
know, so if, if the re leaders are coming for, for show, the wealthy are coming for vacation, the middle class is coming for business, and the poor are coming to beg, then who's coming for Hajj? So when we go, we need to make sure that our intention is for, purely for the pleasure of Allah and His Messenger. Sure. Nothing else. You know, because Allah is pure and accepts only that which is pure. pure. But here when Rasulullah he says that 70 Anbiya, they made Salat in this, in this valley. All of them were coming to make the Hajj. And he even foretold that this is where Isa al Islam will put on his ihram when he goes for the Hajj. <coughs> that valley of Ruha. Okay. And we're going to talk specifically about Musa al Islam later, about his Hajj, inshallah. Uh, probably get to that point next week because time's getting short. We still got a few minutes, so we'll continue uh, a little bit further. So. So he makes Salat in this valley. He tells him that 70 Anbiya made Salat here. And 70 here doesn't mean exactly 70. 70 is an expressive term, meaning scores, you know. So it could even be 100 or a little bit more. Right. They continue the journey. And when they arrive at this place, uh, Araj, when they stop, and they're going to eat. And Rasulullah uh luggage was on the same camel as Abu Bakr uh, luggage. So they were on the same camel, and that camel was being led by one of the slaves of Abu Bakr. And so they're waiting, and their stuff doesn't get there. They're waiting for a long time, and nothing comes. And then finally the slave comes and says that, you know, uh, the camel, they've lost the camel, they've lost the luggage, they don't know where it is. Abu Bakr, he gets angry. He's not angry for himself, he's angry at, why did you lose the luggage of Rasulullah? So, so he starts hitting his slave. And Rasulullah, he says, look at what this muhrim is doing. Muhrim is the one who is in ihram. He says, look at what he's doing. You know, settles him down a little bit. And then, of course, when people find out that, that you know, Rasulullah's luggage is, is lost, everyone wants to bring him you know, something to eat. You know, it's an honor for them. Uh, and they're bringing, and so Rasulullah he accepts a little bit. And he tells Abu Bakr, he says, look, Allah SWT has provided us with all this good food. You know, why are you mad? And he says, Abu Bakr, let this pass. You know, let your anger pass. And then... Abu Qais and Sa'ad radiallahu anhumah, they come and they offer Rasulullah SAW their luggage. And Rasulullah SAW is sitting there and he tells them, you know, he, he thanks them and says, may Allah bless you for the offer, but alhamdulillah there's no need. Our luggage and our camel has been found. Now, this again is the knowledge of Rasulullah from whom nothing is hidden. Nothing is hidden from the knowledge of Rasulullah SAW, even a normal mu'min. Allah SWT says that fear the sight of a Rasulullah SAW said, fear the sight of a mu'min because he sees through the nur of Allah. Is anything hidden from the nur of Allah? And who is more, who is the one who, whom we accept and try to become a mu'min other than Rasulullah So what is hidden from him? He could have told them in the beginning that this is where the camel is, go get it. He didn't. Because he's teaching us a process. That this is the world of cause and effect. You have to go through the means in order to get the end. So he allows them to find it, but he already knows, oh, it's already found. No one came and told him, oh, the camel's been found. He told them that. It's already found, don't worry about it. Inshallah, you know, I'll end here today.
uh, we'll continue with the Hajj of Rasulullah Sussum next week and probably for the next few weeks. Uh, I will try to relate it even to other historical stuff uh, as well as current situations, inshallah. Uh, maybe that will make it easier to remember. Uh, and, um, you know, so may Allah SWT, you know, give us his true love and the true love of Rasulullah. Wasallam, his family, his companions, and all of those whom they love, inshallah. Those who have not made sunnah, go and make sunnah, inshallah.